All right, so my name is James Mel. I um, I'm a student of computer science, so this I think this presentation will be a bit more in depth than others and a bit more technical, but I think that makes sense because it seems to me that there's a confusion about how Bitcoin works. I hope I can clarify this. So as a as a student of computer science, oh one second the last time. So yes, now perfect. So as a student of computer science, you get asked many questions. So why does my computer not work? And uh, like, will machines take over the world at some point? Or also, should I invest in Bitcoin? And I was a bit like, I didn't really care about Bitcoin. I found the technology interesting, but I didn't know, yeah, invest or not. Yeah, well, sure, why not? And then I heard about the environmental impact of Bitcoin, and I really was a bit furious, because it seemed like very loud. And I'm very happy that I can present it today, so I could do research and really understand why the impact is so big and yeah, explain it to others. So maybe you know about Bitcoin because of this chart. So in December last year, Bitcoin skyrocketed. So in a matter of a few months, the value um, increased 20 folds. Of course, people got interested, like uh, teenagers became millionaires and gave advices for others to invest or like uh, um, blogs that would claim that cryptocurrencies will be the future for all the ideological reasons that we heard last week, or YouTube videos that were very uncritical and just explain how to invest without explaining the technology and the risks. And it's if you dig in deeper into that, you see that Bitcoin is probably a bubble. So the real value for the society is not clear yet. So many people invest in it, and it's not clear what comes out. Um, also, of course, the skyrocket was only for a short time. Now it's again at uh, about $8,000 per Bitcoin. Still very high. So what should we do? Um, but there are now claims that Bitcoin will end because of that. So like the hype goes in a completely different direction. Um, also, this uh, investment chief of Warren Buffett, so he must know his stuff, right? So he doesn't want people to invest, and maybe it was just a hack that caused this crash, or maybe it's all a pyramid scheme and nobody should ever invest because you get scammed, and there's hacks anyway, you lose your money anyways. And then this guy got involved last week, and he all said, yeah. So if John Oliver gets involved, you know stuff is going, yeah, to the toilet. Um, it's really a mess, and I think you can say, so what? It's a gamble, okay, let people gamble. It doesn't have to concern me if they lose their money. Okay, it's all right, fair point. Um, not completely true, though, because people also want to get grandmas involved now. So yeah, sure, invest all your life savings because it's a good investment, right? Or maybe make a YouTube video of explaining uh, for your grandma how to invest in Bitcoin. So that I find evil. But still, it's, you can claim it's not Bitcoin's fault, it's not the system, it's just the people of you that use it. Except, there's one point I can, you can't deny, it takes up a lot of energy. And this is where my presentation will be. Uh, what my presentation will be about today. And I want every one of you to understand why it consumes so much energy and why it doesn't scale very well. And what the alternatives are. So we need to understand what mining is. Mining has that nice tone so that we can just like let our computers run, uh, consume some electricity, but get us money back. Um, for us, mining would not be profitable at all. Profitable at all. Like, Electricity in Switzerland is far too expensive. We would not get enough coins back. So what, how mining is done in the real world is like this. Warehouses full of these machines in China, in Russia, where the electricity is cheap, just let them run, let them do some calculations and get the money back. And as long as the coins that you get back have a high rate, which is the, so the pro, you get profit based on the electricity you consume, it's all fine. And the machines that are used for those are very, very specific. So these are, um, this one is currently the most efficient one, and it costs like yeah, $2,000, or at least the Asiri costs that much. And 
all it does is just hash, hash, hash. So it, this guessing game that Professor, uh, Dr. Dub Clark um, explained, it's just about guessing. It's very simple, very stupid, but they do it very efficiently. The point is, after a few months or years maybe, these guys are not the most efficient ones anymore, and these data centers just remove everything and buy new ones. So that's also a small, different environmental impact. Maybe the resources from these, for these hardware parts are not that environmentally conscious mind. But that's a different story. We will focus on electricity now. So we need to know what blockchain is, the technology, and how Bitcoin works. And um, Bitcoin works in network, uh, sorry, blockchain always works on a network. So we have nodes, like computers or users using the network. And they have an identification. Of course, it's hard to identify the person to the identification, so it can be anonymous. But yeah, they have an ID. And then we have the blockchain. And the blockchain contains all the transactions that ever happened. So if A wants to make a transaction to B, it's, it's mentioned in the blockchain. And this block is the first block that ever existed. Their money was created, got transferred to some account, and, and these all build on these blocks. So every, every transaction has to come from an account which actually received that money from a previous block. So if you were, for example, to find out as A, how much money do I currently own? You have to go through the blockchain, um, always looking in which in, uh, transactions was I involved. Now, okay, let's, let's say we want to make a new block. We want to make a transaction to the blockchain. So we are B, and we want to transfer four coins to F. Now, we could just add that transaction to the block, to the new block. Would that be all right? Would that be cool? Can we just do that? What's the problem? Question to you. Yeah, I think you mean, yeah, maybe. So it's not clear if B actually owns four coins. He could just own one coin, and then he claims he gives four coins to F. But that's not really cool. cool. So that needs to be checked. Also, what if B just enters a transaction which says, okay, A gives me 4,000 coins without ever the approval of getting the approval of A. So that's bad. We need some regulation here. We need some concept of, of verification. And that's where these nodes come in. So these are additional nodes, and all the transactions go through them. So they check the whole blockchain. Does A actually own 4,000 coins? A, or, or does... <laughs> Does A actually make this transaction, or is it B that, that claims it? Or does B own four coins in order to make it? And if it's true, they add it to the block. So there's, do, you, do you see a problem here? Is that enough, do you think? So if, if just these, we trust these nodes to verify all these transactions, so it's not enough. Because these nodes could also try just fake transactions or say, yeah, yeah, it's verified, it's okay, without checking it or with entering different transactions which gain uh, benefits to them. So we also need to control these nodes. And that's why they don't just verify the transactions. They also have to get accepted by the consensus scheme. And this is where the energy issue comes in. So Consensus scheme can be, there are various consensus schemes we'll go through, uh, I will mention more of them, but what Bitcoin does is proof of work. And that means um, not every node is allowed to produce a new block. They have to be selected, and the selection process works as follows. They have to guess passwords, and now I know half of you know hashing, so it's just reverse of a hash. So they know they have to find out, they have to brute force the correct number such that the hash results in a certain set of numbers. So they have to guess passwords all the time. And as soon as they guess the password correctly, they are allowed to create a block. Um, and so if everything works out, they get some money back. So Z, who created the block, gets some money. 
and it can add it to the blockchain. Perfect. Now, of course, it can still happen that such a block uh, gets the proof of work and is still malicious. So here, for example, the verification is not true. But then the other blocks will come in because they don't like if someone else is malicious. And they add another block which conflicts. And then all with, with, this, with more time passing, with more blocks being created, it's, it's hoped that nobody ever has enough computational power to actually make a long chain of blocks with um, false verifications. And that's why it's considered to be safe. That's also the reason why you should wait six blocks until it's really verified that the transaction passed through. Okay, so that's why we need computational power for this proof of work. And there's also some limitations to blockchain, uh, to Bitcoin. So this is very essential. I, um, the difficulty of a guessing problem is adjusted such that new blocks generated every, are generated every 10 minutes on average. So no matter how many people join the mining network, like if, if we double all the, all the pro, um, computational capacity of the network, still every block will take 10 minutes on average. So all we gain is really the potential to have more decentralization. But in reality, it's not really that because mining center is just stacking up. And then there's also maximum transaction per second of, se uh, of seven. So seven transactions per second. That's a hard limitation of Bitcoin. And um, yes, th there will be a maximum reach of Bitcoin. That's also good because it, leads, it, it means that the inflation will not be in, in infinite. Okay, so how much guessing is done in the world by Bitcoin? So this is the hashing rate or the guessing rate as you, as you want. And as the boom happened in December 17, and as we see, the hashing rate really increased since then. And the hashing rate really corresponds to how much energy is consumed because these hashes are done by these very efficient machines. And if you want to calculate how much that actually is, um, we have I found two nice sources for that. So the Bitcoin Energy Consumption Index is a source that is often stated. So when they say it, Bitcoin takes as much energy as Ireland, it's from this one. Bitcoin Energy Consumption Index, or Denmark, or something like that, Israel, what, whatever you heard. And I think it's a bit of a difficult estimation because they assume that 60% of the economical, uh, of the profit, no, I'm sorry. 60% of the mining income that the miners make is automatically um, um, bought for, uh, used for buying energy. So it's just, that's the assumption. And with that assumption, you receive this number. And it's a bit hard to really, I, I couldn't grasp how you would make that assumption. Maybe it's an economical theory. I don't know. But um, so the biggest um, opponent of this Bitcoin energy consumption seemed to me the RBS blog, R R R MRB's blog, and he makes uh, other uh, assumptions. So the lower bound would be 15 terawatt hours per year for the whole Bitcoin network. And just to be sure, I made my own assumption. I can show you how. So I just took the hash rate and the most, um, the most efficient mining hardware to find a lower bound. Because, of course, the mining hardware is not the most efficient used by miners. Not all use the most efficient mining hardware. Also, they need cooling power. But just for the sake of having a clear estimate that we can all agree on, um, I took this as a lower bound. So this is my own lower bound, basically. And it's quite close to MRB's lower bound. And now let's compare it to some real-world energy consumption. Um, this is now March. Uh, for, for Bitcoin, March instead of January in the last slide, so it's a bit higher. And as you see, the world uses so much energy, and the Bitcoin energy consumption index uses 55 um, terawatt hours per year. That's a quarter percent of the world's energy consumption. The Bitcoin lower bound, my Bitcoin lower bound, is half of that, so it's uh, an eighth of a percent of the world's energy consumption, it's still very much, I would argue. Especially when you compare it to, to, to countries and when you compare it to Google. So all operations of Google, including their research, including the search engine and everything, just takes a fourth of Bitcoin's current power 
estimation, so the lower bound. It could be double that. Also, comparing it to Visa, it's 0 0.19 um, only terawatt hours, so it's far, far less. But this comparison is also not that fair because Visa is piggybacked on the banking system. It just interacts between all these systems and it doesn't have to host every server. So it's arguable if Bitcoin really can be compared with Visa. But still, it's interesting to see, especially because Visa has many, many more transactions per second than Bitcoin. Okay, so now let's come to the CO2 impact. So now we have electricity, but where, is the, where does the electricity come from? So the estimate is that 71% of blocks are mined in China because the uh, electricity is cheap. And I wanted to convert that to CO2. So um, I found this number, so the average Chinese CO2 intensity of electricity, which I found in an um, environmental report. So it's roughly one to one CO2 kilograms per um, kilowatt hours. And this, with the lower bound estimate from, from before, it means that at the current state of Bitcoin, if it were to continue now for a year, it would produce 16 million tons of CO2. How much is that? Well, it's uh, half a per mil of the world's total CO2 uh, emission. So that's also including transportation, heating, everything. It's 7 million drought trips right between Zurich and New York. And it's... Um, so compare... Um, in, in relation to the usage of Bitcoin, so the upper bound assumption of Bitcoin users is 29 million. That's 600 kilograms per user. And that's like, <laughs> it's, it's a twelfth of, of, this consumption of the uh, average consumption of a person in Switzerland, uh, CO2 emission of a person in Switzerland. So I think it's really not... It's, we can't afford to, to use Bitcoin. But that, okay. Um, sustainable amount would be zero tons of CO2. We can't afford to produce more. Of course, that's not realistic. But we are at the point where everything CO2, everything we emit is bad. Maybe you remember Jerry Rifkins in the beginning of our class. He said, we need to be off the carbon-based civilization if you want to have any chance of avoiding the abyss. And uh, the abyss would be climate change with more natural disasters, with extreme heat, with variable rainfall, with sea level rise. So how Bitcoin currently is, it's definitely not sustainable. But maybe it can change. So how does it scale? From my environmental perspective, uh, as more people invest in Bitcoin, the demand gets higher. That means we have higher prices. That means we have more of an incentive for miners to mine, and that leads to more emissions. Also, from a usage perspective, Bitcoin needs to change because the seven per second transactions are so low, and um, the block intervals are also not practical because if you want to pay somewhere, you need to wait one or maybe six blocks. That means one hour until the payment is successfully and securely transferred. Also, the blockchain is growing. Currently, the whole blockchain of Bitcoin takes 161 gigabytes. So no one can have that on your phone. Therefore, you need to a bit of centralization in order to even handle that. So these are solution and alternatives that I like, evaluate for myself. This is, very, um, this is my own opinion. So other people might come up with different conclusions. But let's go through it quickly. So we could forget about decentralized currencies. That would be probably good for our environment, but it's, of course, not very... I mean, we want, we want to bring a new idea. We want to further our society. Also, we could tune the, block bit, uh, the Bitcoin parameters, like block size and uh, um, block intervals, but that would only be a provisoric effect, probably, because the scaling is bad. We could extend Bitcoin with a Lightning Network, I don't really have time to explain that, but um, it's basically um, introducing some, uh, taking, taking transactions off the blockchain so more transactions can happen. That would be good for more people to use it, then the transactions would be faster, um, there would be less CO2 per transaction. 
But I would argue the demand would still rise, and the demand is ultimately that what, what makes the problem, because the miners will still um, have an incentive. And then this is what I go for. I go for other cryptocurrencies, because there are many more cryptocurrencies we can choose from. Most of them have, to have a similar concept, also proof of work, like Bitcoin, but there are also many other proof uh, consensus schemes. So proof of stake, I will shortly explain that in, in a minute, and then many others. I think I have time to go through them. So if I explain proof of stake, I want to show again um, how proof of work works. So you get blocks with a probability um, depending on how much you put into, uh, how much effort you put into the network. So if you put a tenth of all computational power in, in, into the network, you also have a 10% uh, chance of receiving the block. Now with proof of stake, it's the same, but just that your wealth is considered. So you, you say, I stake with my wealth. I, I own a tenth of all the coins in Awesome Coin. And so with a probability of one tenth, I will receive the next block. Now as long as the coins are fairly distributed and not somebody in the network um, owns all the coins or a majority of the of the currency, this can go right. I, um, now the problem is it can also have different problems which I cannot go into. And um, but but there are ways to invest in that. There are cryptocurrencies which are profitable, and Ethereum also, like the second biggest cryptocurrency, um, to also the lead leadership talks about changing Ethereum into a, a stake, proof-of-stake-based system. But of course, yeah, there's criticism as well. And we could start the whole discussion all over. So my conclusion for today, this is bad. Don't invest in cryptocurrencies just blindly. They're really complicated. They have the potential to harm our environment. And just... If you choose to do so, you have to consider risks, uh, financial risk, but you also have to consider sustainable environmental issues. And I think that's not done enough today. And that's my conclusion.